Uh, so welcome everyone, a few of you still coming in, plenty of seats in the front. Um, my name is Jennifer Dill, I'm a faculty member here in Urban Studies and Planning, and along with my colleagues, Professor Chris Monsier back there from Civil and Environmental Engineering, um, we help um, organize this weekly transportation seminar. Um, I have a, f a couple announcements and things, I thought we would do some introductions around the room because we have a little different mix of people today. Um, but one announcement, next week, Friday the 12th, there will not be a seminar in this room at Friday at noon. Um, so if, and the reason for that is because we, the director of um, the Department, Federal Department of Transportation's Research and Innovative Technology Administration, RITA, which is the agency that funds OTREC. Um, the director, Pierre Appel, is going to be visiting us for most of the day on that Friday. We're going to be having an event that we are going to film and we'll have that available online. So the students who are registered in the class actually will need to watch that um, video and sort of replacement um, for attending the seminar live. And so we'll send out the link um, of that to you. So that's business. The other thing, because I know a few of you are new, haven't come to our seminars before, we do webcast the seminars, so there are people out there watching live on the web, and then we archive them later. And how that affects you is that once we get to questions and answers, we ask that you use the microphones when you ask your questions so the people who are watching on the web can hear. Most of the tables have a microphone glued to the desk. You need to hold the touch button. Uh, keep the red light lit while you're asking your question. If for some reason your microphone is missing or does not work, we have the portable mic that one of us will walk around and hand to you. Uh, but we are quite adamant about nagging you to remember to use the microphone because the people watching on the web will nag us if they can't hear you. I want to do, because we have a different crowd today, I do want to do quick introductions around the room, and this will give you uh, some practice and remind you about using the microphones. So just your name and affiliation, and I'm going to start, and we're going to cover this side of the room first. My name is Moeen, and I'm a, a graduate student here at uh, Civil Engineering. My name is Jian Hong, and I'm working with uh, Army Energy here, and Visiting us from China. Yeah. Elaine Wells with Ride Connection. Julie Prooks with Dalaterra Architecture. <laughs> Will mine work? Mine never works, by the way. <laughs> Anything to, anyway, my name is Peggy Linden, and I'm with the Washington County Office of Community Development. Jenny Proctor, also with the Office of Community Development. Caroline Chapman, Masters of Urban and Regional Planning here. I'm Nancy Ferber. I'm a post -bac student. Roger Averbeck, the Multnomah County Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee. Uh, Chris Monsier, Faculty, Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, John Mackler with the staff of OTREC. I'm Ryan Gratzer with the Center for Transportation Studies here. <coughs> Jim Howell from May Order. Kirk Paulson, prospective grad student. John MacArthur, staff of OTREC. Uh, Michael Moore with Sisters of the Road. Brett Frey, civil undergrad. Gabriel Kirschlake, civil undergrad. Justin Willard, civil undergrad. Um, Matt Wu, civil undergrad. Jing Yu, civil grad student. Chu Xin Dai, first year's grad in civil engineering. Jody Patterson, po post bachelor student. Garrett Wolstein, environmental undergrad. Merlin Larimer, uh, PSU geography. Henry Underwood, uh, PSU master's geography. Will Norris, uh, graduate student, Willamette University. Uh, Chase Ballou, I'm a community development graduate working on post bac studies. Sue Vorenberg, I'm a transportation engineering and construction reporter for the Daily Journal of Commerce. Uh, Chris Myers, uh, undergraduate community development major. Emily Nichols, urban studies graduate. April Cutter, Masters of Urban and Regional Planning student. 
<laughs> Karina Rindis, graduate of the Community Development Program at PSU. Joe Broach, a PhD student in Urban Studies. Julia Crane, Master of Urban and Regional Planning at PSU. And I'm Liz Patterson, Master of Urban and Regional Planning at PSU as well. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, we also like to do that because it gives our speakers an idea of who their audience is. And I think what's evident is partly the reason why we are scheduling this seminar. Um, so many of you may be aware that the federal government um, about a year ago or so announced a new partnership uh, between the federal departments of transportation, uh, housing and urban development, and the Environmental Protection Agency focused on livability. And at OTREC, we've been um, working on this issue, and uh, in June, we held a listening session that involved those three agencies at the regional level um, in Oregon. And we brought together people from the housing, from environment, and from transportation professions to talk about <laughs> how those three areas could work together. One thing that became clear is that even though those things all uh, come together to create livable and sustainable communities, as professionals in those areas, we often don't speak the same language or we don't necessarily understand how the other part of that triangle works. And so we felt that to help us in that collaborative effort, that, that partnership that's going forward, that we need some base understanding. And so this is the start of creating that base understanding is housing, um, sort of a housing 101 for transportation students and professionals. So um, to kick that off, we have invited um, two people, two experts in housing here to speak with us today. Uh, we have Andre Tremolay. Um, who is a, um, has her PhD in Urban Studies from Portland State University. She's also a research associate in our Institute on Aging and a Housing Services Specialist for Washington County. She has many years of experience in housing. Um, it's also what her dissertation uh, research was on. And then we have uh, Vince Chioti, a regional advisor to the Oregon Housing and Community Services uh, for the Portland metro area. So they are going to teach us a lot about housing. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks. Well, thank you. Um, it's great to see such a diverse group of people here today. And um, for the civil engineering students, I will tell you that this will probably be something a little different than what you're used to hearing. Um, for the folks who are in affordable housing, including um, my boss and my boss's boss who are here, um, this is probably going to be very familiar territory uh, for you are doing um, various alternative transportation modes. I'm really thrilled to see you here. Uh, we need to have more conversations about work that we can do together. And then um, finally, for uh, the, um, the rest of you, I just want to say welcome and also to the people who are doing affordable housing related work for certain populations like Sisters of the Road. Very glad to have you here. So let me tell you what we're going to be touching on today. I thought it would be um, useful to uh, have six main areas of focus. The first is to, to look at transportation systems and housing systems side by side. They're very different. They speak different languages. They have a different way of doing things, seeing the world, um, and we'll talk about that. The other thing, just like in transportation, you have a specialized language with a lot of acronyms. And um, so I'm going to teach you how to be part of the in crowd in affordable housing by talking, by giving you just a few simple uh, key terms that will help you find your way through that maze. Um, the third area is follow the money. Okay, so uh, how does affordable housing get built? So this part of the presentation is going to take a top-down view of looking at how money comes into the state of Oregon to support the development of affordable housing. And um, so we're going to be throwing a lot of agency names and things like that at you during, during that particular point. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go to a bottoms-up approach. So one of the key things that you'll find out from this presentation is that a key actor in all this are the entrepreneurs, the nonprofit and for-profit affordable housing developers 
who actually develop the housing and make something happen. So we're going to be looking at a sample project which is literally under construction as we speak that happens to be in Washington County that we're very proud of. Um, it's the Knoll in Tigard. And then um, the, the fifth area that we're going to be looking at is planning. So what kind of planning happens around um, affordable housing? And the, the final area is just trying to start to generate some, some ideas about opportunities where planners and people in transportation, um, housing planners and people involved in housing and people involved in transportation can start to have productive conversations. And so where in this process of planning and development are sort of the critical entry points uh, for having, having those kind of conversations. Um, I should say also that uh, because we're all speakered and mic'd, um, Vince and I have decided that if you have questions, go ahead and let us know during the, the, during the presentation and we'll try to address them then. In terms of um, general discussion, like larger, let's hold the larger discussion questions more towards the end and take mostly clarifying questions as we go along. Does that sound okay to everyone? Okay. So the first, um, the first point is um, different characteristics of the two different housing systems. So transportation, there's not a whole lot of contest that it is primarily a public sector domain. Now, obviously, there are nonprofit providers of transportation. There are a variety of different things. But it's a legitimate part of government to build roads, bridges, uh, build transit systems, build bikeways, um, do all those different kinds of things, create safe places for pedestrians. That's you know all part of the public sector domain, often other partners involved. Now, it's interesting. Housing doesn't work that way. Um, when you think about housing, it, most of the housing that gets built in the United States is not built by the public sector. Most of it's built by the private sector, right? And there are people who can't afford the housing that's built by the, public sec by the private sector. And so the issue is that is then built by a range of other types of people, some public, some private, but with, with public investment involved. And so the line between what is the role of government and what is the role of the private sector over the ages has been contested and, and mixed. And that is part of what adds to the complexity of affordable housing as a, as a kind of a domain to think about. And it's, I think, one of, one of the things that makes it difficult for housing planners and transportation planners to have these kind of conversations because we often don't have the kind of answers that you think we should have. Um, compared to trans housing planning, um, uh, transportation planning is planning and orderly. Now, some of you may want to debate that, but compared to our world, I think it's probably a little bit more planned, logical, and orderly. Orderly. The way things happen in housing is far more entrepreneurial. We depend on those nonprofit and for-profit developers to make things happen. Um, so it's very, very different. Your perspective on the transportation side is usually long range, especially if we're talking about infrastructure and things like that. Our perspective is, I mean, the way housing development projects happen, it's way more opportunistic. There's land available, there's money available, you make something happen. You may have a long-term perspective of what the needs are, but in terms of all the pieces coming to, together on a particular project, it's way more opportunistic in terms of how it happens. Um, your planning is very uh, uh, place-specific. You're trying to get people from one place to another via a variety of different uh, modes. Ours is, is different. While we may look at an area such as Washington County or the city of Portland or Clackamas County or someplace else and look at the overall housing needs, we don't get to a map and say, this is the physical site where affordable housing should be, should be built because we don't own the land and it's, we rely on entrepreneurs and it's an opportunistic approach in this sort of mixed, mixed market situation. 
So this is, this is one of the reasons that it's hard to have these kind of coherent conversations about planning with planning and housing. And I think we need to understand our, our, each other's cultures more to be able to have these, um, these kinds of productive conversations. So here's where, we, um, here's where I, I give you some key terms. Um, you've probably heard the term affordable housing. So affordable housing, technically, um, according to HUD, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, is housing for which residents pay no more than 30% of their income for housing costs. Now, I'm thinking Bill Gates probably doesn't spend more than 30% of his income for his housing costs. So um, it usually means housing uh, for people of modest means. Um, and there are all kinds of definitions about what we mean about modest means, for which residents pay no more than 30% of their income for housing costs. Um, it's often conflated to mean subsidized housing. So subsidized housing is housing that's built with the assistance of government subsidies of some sort. Now, interestingly, we don't think about this, but even single family homes have um, a government subsidy built into them. We just don't think about it that way. You know that mortgage um, uh, interest deduction that you take off on your taxes? That's actually a type of government subsidy. You're foregoing, uh, the government is foregoing income to give you a tax break. So technically, all kinds of housing in, in, in this country is, is subsidized. But we think of subsidized housing as being housing for poor people. Public housing is a very particular type of affordable housing. It is housing that's owned and operated by local housing authorities. And it was created over a period of time using um, a very certain, a certain model. So the housing authority for, the, uh, for Portland and Multnomah County is the Housing Authority of Portland. Um, so, and they own gobs of housing. Um, it, some of it's public housing and some of it was created in different, with different programs using other different sources. So um, just one more kind of uh, piece on that whole idea of subsidy, what's subsidized and unsubsidized. Um, unsubsidized housing is housing that is provided by the market. And it's, um, it's poster child, let's call it, is single family detached homes. Um, it's a, usually a source of pride and wealth. But as we just said, it's actually subsidized too. It's just subsidized in a different way. Subsidized housing, the housing that we consider being subsidized, is for those who can't afford market rate housing. And it's often stigmatized, right? People who live in, in subsidized housing are often viewed as not being able to make it. And um, that's just the way our society operates. An example of subsidized housing is public housing, but there are other types too, and we're going to be talking about those. Microphone, yeah. I have a quick question. In, how is it subsidized? I've heard of like vouchers, um, yes. or what are some of the ways in which subsidized housing is subsidized? We're going to be getting to that, but let me just address um, the voucher question because it's something that we don't really deal with in this presentation. Sometimes the money goes into um, subsidized housing as bricks and mortar. So, um, the government might, at various levels, might pay to physically develop a type of housing. The other way it works, and this is sort of how it shows the dual mind, so thank you for your question about how it's both the private sector and the public sector that, that are contributing towards this. People who are of lower income um, can obtain vouchers that pay some of the, the, the rental costs, the cost of renting housing that meets certain housing quality standards and so forth. So they can go to, uh, and it's their, their maximum amounts, it's, it's modest housing. So they can take their, their voucher and go to uh, Joe Landlord 
and say I have a housing voucher, um, it will pay, I can afford 30% of my income is whatever, this will help make up some of the difference. Now it's more complicated than that. But um, one of them is, is um, a supply side subsidy, that's when it goes into literally providing the supply of affordable housing. The other is more of a demand side um, subsidy that goes in subsidizing the people who need housing and they could take it different places. It's often referred to as Section 8 vouchers because Section 8 is the part of the code that, um, that deals with that. Vince, do you have anything you want to add on that? I think that's good. And there's always a long waiting list to get vouchers with almost every housing authority. And it's there's 25 housing authorities. 26, in this. yeah. Okay. And for example, right now, the Housing Authority of Portland, you can't even get on their waiting list. Um, it, it's, it, they open it up for two weeks every few years, and it's just because the demand is so hard. It's not because they're, they're, what, they're good people, but there's just so much demand. So, um, so here's the other part of your question. Where does the money come from? Um, and we're going to be going into this in a little bit more detail. So nationally, the bulk of the money comes from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, another source of financing is something called low-income housing tax credits. And interestingly enough, that is administered by the IRS because it's a tax credit program. Um, and it allocates money to states. Uh, in Oregon, Oregon Housing and Community Services allocates that money to developers, and Vince is going to be talking a little bit about that process. A third and smaller kind of pot of money is rural development, another federal agency, and that serves communities of less than uh, 10,000. And at the state level, Oregon Housing and Community Services uh, has some additional pots of money that Vince is going to be talking about in a minute that they can bring to bear, as well as um, administering some of the national funds. At the local level, most jurisdictions don't use their general fund to subsidize affordable housing. Uh, the city of Portland has, um, and the other possible local source of actual cash is tax increment financing and urban renewal districts. So Portland Development Commission, for example, in the Portland area might use and does use um, some of their resources from tax increment financing to fund the development of subsidized housing for people of modest means. Um, another real critical part of the funding process are just regular lenders, um, people who uh, banks and so forth that provide the loans that go into developing affordable housing because it is a combination of loans and I'll call it grants, but it's a variety of different other sources that you don't have to pay back r right away that, that go for actually making the development happening. And then foundations, donations, fundraising are all other, other sources of housing. In terms of, oh, I said 26. Yeah, it's 22. It's 22. Um, so there are 22 public housing um, uh, authorities in, in the state. Um, there's a website address for their association if you want to kind of go and look at who serves what and so forth. And um, HUD money, some of the HUD money goes directly to um, operating that public housing. So it goes to public housing agencies to pay for the cost of operating the housing. Um, HUD also has special purpose grants. And so these are grants for which um, there's a national competition. So um, an examples of a couple of those programs that have been around for a long time is something called the HUD 202 program. And again, 202 applies to a public law that uh, it was embedded in when it first got started. And that bills housing for older adults. Um, the HUD 811 program bills housing or pays for the development of housing for persons with disabilities. And there are many other types of those. And they come, that money becomes available through a notice of funding availability that, that HUD issues. 
Um, and then besides those special grants that developers apply for themselves, and by a, when I say developers, I mean for-profit and non-for-profit, there's also money that comes down to localities through a formula that HUD has set up and said, well, we're going to give, rather than us administering all this money, we think that states and local communities are better equipped to be able to decide which projects get funding. So um, some of the, the, the key programs are listed there. Um, the main one that funds housing is HOME, H-O-M-E, all caps, doesn't stand for anything, it's not an acronym, it's just HOME, all in caps. It's one of the many absurd things that you'll find out about this world. Um, another grant that you may have heard about that comes to localities is a community development block grant program. But it's not primarily used for housing. As a matter of fact, the federal government, for all kinds of complicated historical reasons, doesn't let local jurisdictions, um, they have one small loophole, uh, spend that money for new housing construction. It can be used to spend for housing rehabilitation, but not, not new construction. Another one is um, an emergency shelter grant, and that's used to support homeless folks, uh, housing for homeless folks, so different kinds of shelter. And then the last area is housing for persons, uh, people with AIDS. And in terms of the uh, dollar amounts, um, this little chart just gives you a sense of, um, and it's a scale of millions of dollars on the side, um, how the money flows to um, Oregon in 2010. So the, the red on bottom is the money um, for, the, um, for the state that the state administers. There are for the home program, there are six jurisdictions that meet HUD's criteria for getting home money directly. The rest of the state, the balance of the state, um, Oregon Housing and Community Services administers that money. Um, one of those six jurisdictions is, is Portland, and it's the biggest. It gets the largest um, pot. So that kind of gives you an idea of how that money is distributed. The community development block grant funds, remember most of those aren't used for housing, the emergency shelter grant, and then housing for persons with AIDS. So the role of local jurisdictions, um, there are, as I said, six local ju jurisdictions who qualify, and this is HUD speak again, as participating jurisdictions, which means they get home money every year based on a formula set at the, at the national level. And they get it because they meet certain threshold requirements that HUD has set for which jurisdictions get the money. And mostly it has to do with being big enough. There are other, there are other um, uh, issues as well or other criteria that fit in there as well. So in, in Oregon, it's Portland, which includes Multnomah County and the city of Gresham, Clackamas County, Washington County, which includes Beaverton, Salem and Kaiser, which is one together, Eugene, Springfield, and Corvallis. And these local jurisdictions allocate and administer home funds. And they, but they don't just, they, they can't just do whatever they want with it. There are, it's one of the reasons I'm employed, is, is that HUD has extensive rules um, about how that money can be used. And so some of us devote a part of our life figuring ways to work with those extensive rules and actually make development happen. Um, each jurisdiction has its own processes and timetables, and they also, once the project is built, they have a role in monitoring it to make sure that it remains decent housing, that low-income people are living there, and um, uh, that is being successfully run. So our job doesn't end when we give the money, uh, allocate the money. It continues beyond that throughout the period that uh, it has to remain affordable. The other thing that, we're gonna, that we do that I'll say a little bit about at the end is that um, we don't just randomly decide every year who's gonna, how the money gets allocated. We are guided by something called a consolidated plan. Um, and this is a really important document if you're working with these six jurisdictions. 
um, to look at their consolidated plans and see what kind of priorities they have for allocating the funds. Uh, the alloc actual allocations happen annually in most jurisdictions. Some jurisdictions allocate it ahead of time, but generally um, the allocations are made on an annual basis, but in, they have to be in harmony with this uh, three to five year consolidated plan. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Vince, who's going to talk a little bit about Oregon Housing and Community Services and what they do. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I got my master's in planning here about 25 years ago, and this space is bigger than the whole building was uh, where we were housed before. This is very nice. Um, first of all, I think as far as the housing side, I think it's best to think of us as a finance agency. And she, Andre talked about the money. It's the money. It's always the money. And so we're a finance agency. We do a lot of planning and helping, but if the projects have to pencil or else they don't move forward. So as she said, we're the administrator of the HUD resources for the balance of the state. Um, I have had lots of experience with HUD, with home, uh, because I just have the metro park now. I don't have to use home, and I'm glad. It's very complicated, very cumbersome, and uh, difficult to use. Uh, she did, Audrey did say it's the biggest source uh, of capital, and actually it's the biggest source of just cash comes in. Yeah. But the low-income housing tax credits, which were put in the 1986 tax bill, is without question the biggest subsidy for affordable housing in the nation. Uh, each state gets a certain amount of the uh, tax credits, uh, depending on population. I'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, but it brings a ton of money into the state. Uh, besides the tax credits, we're a lender of, of affordable housing, um, single family, you've heard of the first time home buyers program, that's us. We make a lot of multifamily loans, at least historically have. We're not a uh, general fund agency, we're self-funded. Uh, we have historically funded ourselves by selling tax-exempt bonds and then loaning those proceeds out at about 75 basis points, 0.75% uh, uh, more than we uh, sold them for, and that's how we live. Unfortunately, with this economy the last four years, we have not sold many bonds, and so uh, I might not be here next time somebody asks me. Uh, yeah, next slide. Um, low income housing tax rates, again, it did come out in, in 86. There's two types. One is competitive. Uh, it brings about 60 to $70 million a year every annually into the state in equity for affordable housing. Uh, it's a very competitive process. We have one application annually, and uh, unfortunately, only about half the people who apply to us uh, win. The second type of uh, tax credits is uh, much less equity, but it's not competitive. It's tied to the use of tax-exempt bonds. Uh, up until a couple of years ago, we were probably in the metropolitan area building between 200 and 800 housing units a, a year using that tool, those tools. Again, because the economy, and I won't get into all the financing, but that does not work well. But on the, on the competitive type of uh, tax credits, it's the major portion of the money for that development. It covers about 65% of the total development cost. The other money has to come from the places Andre talked about, loans, uh, home maybe from uh, Washington County or from Portland and other local sources. But, but tax credits drive the show on these things. Uh, next slide. Some other state funds, I won't go into all of them, but two other state funds we have uh, in our, um, that we al allocate money to, and we have our these monies go out annually in a one-time consolidated funding cycle application. So we have like nine or ten sources of, of money, and we hand them all out through this one application. People may be applying to us for only one of those sources for all ten. But uh, so annually we have an application. Uh, it, it, the tax rates are in that, home is in that, as well as two other funds, the trust fund and document recording fee. The trust fund was uh, established in 1991. It's the only new money we had had into affordable housing until last session uh, by a lot of work of housing advocates who had been working on a process for five or ten years. Uh, the legislature last session passed a document recording fee, which means $15 of each document that's recorded goes into this fund, and we believe it's going to generate about $18 million of biennium for affordable housing. Next slide. Who builds affordable housing? Um, lots of folks. Uh, there are probably about 25, oh, I think it says here, it doesn't, uh, in uh, 39 members of Oregon On, which is an uh, organization around the state of community development corporations. And Oregon On people, the numbers are here, they've built over 15,000 units, uh, they've 
put about $1.5 billion of investment into, into the uh, communities that they work in. Uh, it's not just CDCs, though. There are obviously for-profit developers who do a lot of these projects. And there's special needs providers who are not necessarily CDCs, uh, agencies that uh, house uh, people with chronic, chronically mentally ill or developmentally delayed or whatever kind of special needs it is who are service providers but also need to have that five-person group home, they will come to us for, finding, for finding, financing to build those houses. Go ahead. Um, it's unbelievably complicated. <laughs> uh, lots of times there are six, seven, eight, nine sources of funding into an affordable apartment building. Uh, and it's six or seven or eight or nine people who think they're in charge. And it's six or seven, nine people who all have policies and regulations that are in total opposite of the other seven or eight people. So doing these projects is taking these, bouncing uh, these many balls and making sure that you're not in violation of somebody. Uh, putting a tax rate deal together, you're going to spend probably $200,000 just on your attorneys and accountants. That's just that cost. Uh, it's a very time consuming, cumbersome, process. Unfortunately, the low-income housing tax credit is the major source we have, and so that's what we have to use. Um, what does housing cost? And that's all over the place. Uh, I made some notes to myself. Uh, it depends a lot, obviously, on the price of land. I just worked on a project out in uh, Western Washington County, where I think the land cost was $120,000 an acre for multifamily housing, working on one in the Pearl District where the land was $5 million an acre. Obviously, those apartments are going to cost different to build. Uh, SDCs, systems development charges, could be as little as $500 in some communities. And we have a couple of communities here in the metro area that SDCs are $18,000 a door for an apartment. So you might pay $45,000 per unit for the land. $18,000 per unit for SDCs, you've just spent fifty dollars or $60,000, and you haven't talked to the bank yet, and you haven't bought a nail for construction. So you can see that apartments are going to be all over the place. And uh, unfortunately, that's what we're seeing in the Portland metropolitan area. It takes, us, takes about $200,000 or more to build an apartment unit because of all the complications. This is you. Yeah, so um, that's kind of the top-down look um, of trying to bring all these different funding, all these different funding sources and funding streams. And so this next part is taking more or less the perspective of an entrepreneur. I mean, a, a, a local nonprofit housing development organization, um, a community development corporation, a CDC, Community Partners for Affordable Housing. And um, they are in the process of building a housing for um, older adults in Tigard. It's 48 units. And so this next part of the presentation sort of says, OK, so what did it take to actually have be in construction now? Well, a couple of things about this project. I mean, um, we're very proud of it because it is in such a great location. Um, it is very near, um, it is in down, whoops, it is in uh, downtown Tigard. Um, the senior center, library, and transit center are all right near, right nearby. And it's, it's on Hall Boulevard. It's a really an excellent location. And actually you'll find that a lot of our affordable housing developers are very, very sensitive to wanting to locate their housing near um, near transit in particular or near destinations that people want to go to. And some jurisdictions uh, like um, Washington County um, actually provide more points in the ranking process and the rating process when we get applications in if they're located in an area that is rich with opportunity. So that can mean access to uh, uh, transit. That can mean access to services that people need. Um, it can mean if you've got a family project, access to good schools. We have a whole process in our county for, um, for looking at that. 
but very often um, uh, access to good transportation is, 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 a, is something that is looked at. So this particular project, uh, to tell you a little bit about it, it's 48 affordable units for older adults, 55 and older. Um, 12 are set, set aside for veterans. Um, and these are set aside actually because there are um, something known as project-based vouchers uh, that are going into this. And so, um, but these units are set aside for people of very low income who, um, <clears throat> who are veterans, 12 of them. It has a number of features that make it really good housing for older adults. Um, it's elevated so people don't have to climb stairs. It has um, universal design principles, and universal design principles mean that it's designed in such a way that um, it works for people with various physical disabilities as well as um, the general public, um, but those, those features aren't necessarily intrusive. Um, they're just there. Uh, it's very, very, it's sort of the, the new wave or the newest uh, uh, goal in terms of developing senior housing. As we talked about, it's in a pedestrian, transit-friendly location. And um, it's actually becoming a catalyst for downtown development around it in terms of taking a site that wasn't in such great shape and turning it into a really attractive downtown resource. Um, significant street and sidewalk improvements are going on in conjunction with this. And it has a number of cutting edge sustainability f uh, features that um, uh, Sheila Greenlaw Fink, the executive director, would be very unhappy if I didn't point out to you. And I'll do that in just a second. So just to give you an idea, I mean, it takes a really, we talked to you a little bit about some of the complexity of, of projects. Um, this particular project took five and a half years okay, before it was, it was built. Um, the first funding application came into Oregon, uh, came into Washington County in October 2005. At that point, they were actually looking at a different site. They had site control on a different site. Things fell through. It didn't work. Um, so they ended up um, uh, uh, getting site control in October in, uh, of 2008 with the construction beginning on a different site, construction beginning in April 2010 leasing beginning in uh, this January. They already have um, a list that they are keeping for people who are interested in moving there. So you can contact them and get on their waiting list if you're 55 or older and of lower income. And um, they're looking for a lease update or a completion date of April 2001. I um, was at a meeting with Sheila, the executive director, recently, and she said that they're actually well, it wasn't Sheila, it was one of her staff, and they said that they're actually um, a month ahead of, of schedule on the construction. So it's not due to the lack of diligence of these organizations, it's the complexity of the project that makes it take so long. And the, as Vince said, the complexity is, is you've got all these different funding sources, and as an entrepreneur, with conflicting requirements and everything else, as an entrepreneur, you piece them together. And so this particular project, um, these are just some of the principal funding sources that are involved. Um, Oregon Housing and Community Services, uh, $2 million from the federal stimulus bill. Washington County, uh, we contributed $1.5 million of home and 450000 of community development block grant funds. And I believe that was primarily for infrastructure developments around the site. So it wasn't the housing specifically, but with some of those uh, sidewalk and other, uh, other improvements. Um, Washington County Housing Authority uh, create, uh, uh, committed 12 housing vouchers for veterans. Um, Metro uh, contributed a transit-oriented development grant of 150000 The city of Tigard, um, I think, did some things with development fees and so forth that they were able to do. Their construction lender, so the short-term financing for construction, was um, J.P. Morgan Chase. The Enterprise Foundation um, is, uh, is in it, the investor, and they're putting into the project $5.7 million in exchange for getting um, over $5.7 million in 
tax um, not deductions, ta tax Credit. credits, Credit. that's the word I'm looking for, tax credits over a 10-year period. So that's how tax credits work. Investors put the money in up front. They take, um, they essentially get their money back uh, by being able to reduce their tax liability for other things over a 10-year period. And then the permanent lender is NOAA, which is a consortium of local banks. They're the permanent lender, and um, there's $1.6 million that goes into that. I just want to follow up on that. So it's a $10 million deal, and the loan is only $1.6 million. So it took 8.4 of other equity and subsidies to make this project work. Right. So the way to think about that is you're a homeowner, and um, you want a house that's going to cost a hundred thousand dollars? Help me with my decimal. Sixteen, sixteen thousand. Uh, well, let's say you want one that's going to cost a hundred thousand, but you only have sixteen thousand dollars to. You only, you only borrow sixteen. You only you can only afford to borrow. Thank you, Vince. Yeah. He's the finance guy. <laughs> <laughs> you can only afford to borrow um, sixteen thousand dollars because that's all the income that you have. And so you have to uh, go talk to your uncle, your grandmother, and every, everyone else to try to get the other money. And that's, that's kind of the way to think about it. Um, and uh, so with the, with, the, with the lender then, rather than income, the money is coming in from essentially the rent that people pay. So people are so low income that who are living there, the rent, the revenue from rent after costs will only support $1.6 million loan on a $10 million project, and the rest of it has to come in as subsidy. So that's kind of a, a, a two-minute version of housing finance, um, affordable housing finance. Um, these are the sustainability features that I was talking about. Um, one of them I think you might be able to see. There's something called the living wall, and this is actually plants along a... Um, uh, sturdy design element. It's a passive solar t uh, tool. They're given the type of vegetation at certain times of the year. It's leafy. Other times it's not. That works in terms of passive solar. Uh, it's an iconic design element, which means it's their signature. And um, it's a small uh, kind of acknowledgement to, to nature in an otherwise pretty uh, well-built up environment. The rainwater is collected for reuse. Um, it's energy efficient, durable envelope, and finishes um, energy efficient appliances with a whole lot of attention to indoor air quality uh, so that the air recirculates often. So, um, so that's kind of our project from the bottom up. Now, uh, before we conclude, we want to say a little bit about planning. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about uh, planning at the local level, and then Vince is going to talk a little bit about planning at the state level with the understanding that the state is more of a finance agency, a bank, a lender. Um, and, uh, uh, but in terms of localities, we have to do these things called consolidated plans. They're prescribed by our major funding source. We have to have one in place that's approved by them in order to be able to continue to get that money that's earmarked for us. They're on a three to five year time horizon. Washington County just adopted theirs. Uh, we just adopted ours in June of this year. May, um, it was approved by HUD in September of this year. It includes really good information about um, you know, what's the market for housing, and who's left out of that market, and what needs are unmet, and what needs should we be dedicating our limited resources to in terms of providing subsidized housing. And then we s use that information to set priorities. Um, so we think it's really important, for example, to address the needs of folks that are homeless in Washington County. We sent be benchmarks in terms of the number of units um, that we hope to produce. Um, and also we describe a whole bunch of other related actions that we uh, might want to do, like coordinate better with transportation planners that, aren't, that are different kinds of, of, of uh, activities that we need to do. As I mentioned, um, 
the document which commits money to specific projects is done annually, and it's the annual action plan. Um, and the allocation of funds to specific categories, that's what they do in Portland. Most other jurisdictions commit the money to actual projects, so like uh, the project in Tigard we just spoke about. And that actually, um, in many jurisdictions, happens around May. Um, and then we have to report to HUD on what we do. And we put our annual report goes in um, in September of every year. And it's called a CAPER, and that stands for something, consolidated something, <laughs> something, something. And um, I know that there are people who know what that is, but um, we'll just keep going. And then um, Vince is going to talk about the state. Uh, that building that she went through is almost done, and it's, it's beautiful. And I guess I want to point something out that you can usually tell apartment buildings that are financed by us and other uh, affordable housing agencies, they look better than the market. We demand a lot, and uh, it works. My office is in down the Pearl District by uh, I can, the park there. And you can go into the park, and I can sh you can see 12 buildings. Three of those buildings are affordable housing for very low-income people. You cannot tell from the street which one is which. I think that's a good sign that we attempt to make sure we integrate people into the communities, not isolate them. Um, we also do the consolidated plan, but the document that Washington County does is amazing and goes into detail. We're doing a document for the balance of the state. And quite honestly, when interviewing people in Klamath Falls one day and Astoria one day and Burns the next day, our consolidated plan is something we do because HUD says you have to do it if you can't have the money. It's not a planning document by any stretch of the imagination compared to the local ones. Uh, we also have something that has to be done uh, for the uh, uh, low-income housing tax rates, which is called the Qualified Allocation Plan. And that is a document that changes every two years that has a lot of input from folks uh, to help us figure out how we want to design and what we want to do. I'm working on a potential thing now to uh, change how we fund uh, money in the Portland metropolitan area and put more money into large TOD projects, transferred development projects, and we're going to have to go in and change the QAP to do that because it's not in there now. Um, we do have a housing needs prioritization where we want to build, we want to go to the community and build what is the most needed not what just can be marketed or leased up. We want to hit the, play, the people that have not been served. The example I use always is we have a community in Southern Oregon that has 18 subsidized projects, either from us or HUD or USDA, RD, or anybody. Uh, uh, they have 16 projects. 15 are for elderly people. Somebody came in and wanted to build another senior project. We said, no, you haven't met the need of any other population in this community meet that need first. And so that's kind of why we've set that up. And that is updated annually. And so people come to us and say, I want to build XYZ in this community. And we'll go to the chart and say, you can compete, but you're not going to win. And so because we are truly trying to aim it at the needs in that community. Is this you or me? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think Vince and I are both going to talk a little bit about these next um, next slides. These are just some ideas that we have for better coordination between um, planning uh, for housing, affordable housing, and planning uh, for transportation. And we welcome your ideas here because we don't always we don't know your system that well. Um, so I mean, one thing is get involved in state and local consolidated planning uh, processes. Um, and the idea of uh, uh, that maybe there might be some opportunity for some geographic targeting um, around transit-oriented development. Um, and also uh, another thought is to, um, when you do your transportation plans, I mean, you have to do outreach and all like that as well. Invite us to the table. You know, let us tell you what we know about what we're doing and what our plans are. Um, another place, and so that's kind of at the uh, coordinating with jurisdictions or the state level. Uh, let me add, let me yeah, do something please. Else. About 12 years ago, there was a governor called John Kitzhopper who put together something called the Community Solutions Teams, and there's nine of them around the state. And basically, it's seven or eight, six or seven state agencies. It's us, it's Economic Development, it's ODOT, DEQ, DLCD. And we meet on a monthly basis in those communities to talk about needs and things, and it's been 
unbelievably valuable. There's two or three projects that I've worked on that had I not had the kind of contact I had with ODOT, there would have been many more problems there were. So he, Governor Kitsapik's idea was to get people out of their silos and work together instead of independently. And as a matter of fact, that project she just showed on Hall, Hall is a, is a state highway. Mm -hmm. And they were having some huge issues. And because of that kind of coordination, we were able to save a lot of time and money for the project. And just to follow up on that, uh, uh, another place that you can enter into the process is to work with um, developers on specific projects. So um, uh, if you, uh, for example, if the housing um, is, the, is, is the lead on a particular thing, like a particular housing development is going to happen, we're often knocking at doors for transit and street improvements. Not we, the developers are. Um, but we'll be right behind them. And then if transportation is the lead, if you have some transportation improvement planned, think about housing that can be supportive to that and think about affordable housing and come to us and let us help you do some outreach um, around that. Uh, a key area, and I have, I'm not sure how this is with the latest takings rules and all like that, or actually it's uh, uh, urban renewal rules, but um, so a number of our projects have been on uh, surplus land that was for a transportation project initially or was um, going to be a substation for TriMet that then um, we were able to work with them and bring in a nonprofit developer that then became, uh, it became subsidized housing. And I can tell you removing the cost of land is well, is, is a huge subsidy into a project right there. So, or even reducing it, or even making it a fair price, not just a market price. And I know that transportation projects have requirements of uh, land has to be sold at certain values, but um, I'm still hopeful that that might be an area we could work in. Um, then in terms of long-term planning, wouldn't it be great if we kind of got together and uh, as you are working on your long-term plans and identified opportunities for joint planning of transportation um, improvements and subsidized housing. I mean, we're on a time, five-year time frame. That doesn't prevent us from thinking more long-term than that. And, you know, certainly open to that. And again, um, the key uh, to making things happen is control of the land by either a public entity or a nonprofit. That is the key. If you have that, you can make a lot of things happen. Then Vince has some comments about some additional ideas. We, in our consolidated funding, uh, in our consolidated funding cycle application, especially in the urban area, the transporta public transportation is, is key. I can't think of the last time in the Tri-County area we built an apartment building that wasn't within a few blocks of either Max, streetcar, or uh, bus. Bill and I work in my offices is a 242 unit low income housing project. He has 90 parking spaces of which 25 are vacant. So 200, well almost 200 people live in that building without a vehicle and it's very easy to do. So we designed to the best of our ability to build our housing to where people don't need cars. Uh, I'm working on something now to change some of the way we fund especially in the metropolitan area. I think the new uh, line out to uh, Clackamas Town Center cost $1.4 billion. Because of the limits we put on our application now, we were successful in building a 42-unit apartment building next to that. That's not very good leverage of federal money. So we're trying to change it so we can build bigger, more complete projects. And I will have to go back and change the QAP and change some other things. But we're trying to take our money and make sure we leverage it well with transportation money. Um, design. Which we're really big on uh, designing big streets. We don't just want to have people not to have cars. We want them to be able to, to do everything in town, walk, bike, shop. Uh, in the smaller communities, working with ODOT, ODOT has a mentality. We're supposed to move cars from A to B. That doesn't always make for good pedestrian design or livability. And ODOT's getting better at that. We're working, but they still like to move people uh, as fast as they can. Uh, <laughs> And then the last one is um, this idea of development-oriented um, transit. I mean, you often hear about transit-oriented development, but what if housing were the lead? And um, so when uh, you're making transportation investments, 
whether it be in transit or uh, bikeways or um, whatever it might be, um, consider existing and proposed affordable housing sites uh, um, when you locate transit stops, um, when you deal with things like highway speeds and so forth, and when you make investment in, in other kinds of amenities. So that concludes our presentation. And I think we'll take questions, comments, ideas. And I don't, Jennifer, do you want to um, help us? I will. We are at 1 o'clock. OK. Yeah. Uh, oh, we dear. got started a little late because of introductions. But if, if people have to go because it's 1, we understand that. Be a little quiet so the people who do want to stay and ask questions um, can. And remember to use your microphone. So any burning question? Sure. One here. My question is to uh, Vince. I saw a side heading that quantitative analysis of housing needs. Uh, could you just uh, tell me what are the factors you use to uh, evaluate those needs? Uh, no, I can't because <laughs> I, I know that I know we have them, but I'm going to have to look them up. I'd love to get back to you on that. But we do. We did put in. Uh, we we have all kinds of different. Uh, subsets, and I don't know all the factors off the top of my head, but I do ha I can get that information to you. So if you want, I will get back to you. Thank you, sir. Um, in the in the list of many many funding sources that that these housing projects have available to them, um, the money doesn't seem to be very much involved. Are there any full fully funded by the government housing projects? And if there are not, um, or and if there are, how does how does private involvement change the face of the fund the, of the project and as a whole? There used to be the answer is there used to be uh, housing authorities used to get their public housing fully funded by the government. Uh, starting about twenty well thirty years ago, about nineteen eighty, HUD started getting out of that business, and so you don't see those anymore. The two hundred two s and eighty elevens used to be fully funded by the government. <coughs> Their prices stayed the same, and the costs went up. So now they have to come to other sources to, to balance it out. I can't think of the last time I saw a fully funded government uh, project by one government agency. We have quite a few examples in Portland, but that's five or six agencies all putting their money in. So we, yes. do, we do have some buildings with no debt on them. You pretty much have to have no debt if you're going to serve very low income people or homeless people. You can't have somebody uh, who has a $300 a month income paying uh, rent. It just doesn't pencil. I'll just add that we are frustrated um, with the inefficiency of the system. Um, and also, that's not our, we can't, we don't have the leverage to be able to change it because the money is coming down from, from the federal level. But um, yeah, a lot of money is spent on lawyers rather than bricks and mortar. Not that I have anything against lawyers, but it'd be nice to spend more money on bricks and mortar and services and services and things like that, as opposed to um, even paying people like me uh, to you know to to monitor this stuff. It'd be better. It'd be way more efficient. That's one of the crazy things about our system, and it has to do with the fact that we're of two minds. Um, is it the public sector or the private sector? And this belief that the way housing gets built is kind of an entrepreneurial process. Very good question. Yeah. Uh, sort of on that vein, if there was just like uh, one aspect of the funding system that you could change to make things better, <laughs> which, which do you think would be just like the one that would be, you know, the biggest obstacle to you? If, if I could choose what to do, yes. I would get me out of a job, I take all these funding sources away, and I increase the, the Section 8 vouchers by about 12-fold, and let the market go ahead and build housing. But that's my bias. Uh, the process we have now is just way too cumbersome and too slow. And, and I have a, I mean, you'll, any person you ask will have a different perspective. Uh, there are different kinds of special needs housing that uh, have different physical characteristics, people for who are quadriplegics, for example, um, have to have certain things built in. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe vouchers could, could get us there, maybe not. 
So if I had a magic wand, um, I would start with consolidating funding sources um, and doing away with the inefficient tax credit way of funding um, projects and make that in place of people foregoing, in place of the government foregoing income, just make it a direct subsidy program. So rather than people, the money that would otherwise go into tax credits, just simply make it um, a funding stream that directly affords, uh, funds affordable housing. But I don't think that's going to happen um, in, uh, given no. the co political no. complexion of no, that our was country. A, that was a, no, it's not. That was Tax Bill of 86 was the last time anything major happened, and that's, what, 25 years ago? Yeah, and I think Ronald Reagan was president. Yeah, and that, but the tax credit bill was actually written by Bob Packwood, Oregon Senator. Interesting. Maybe that's a good note uh, <laughs> to end on, at least uh, what I was referring to was how you would change the system if you could wave your magic wand. I want to thank you both very much uh, for coming today and remind people that we don't have a live seminar next week. So thank you. I think it's on our webpage. Yes, sir. So look. Go, go.